I'm wondering in this crowd this morning, uh, which of the two groups of people in this world you fall into. How many of you are the type of person that when the gas gauge in your car gets down below about half a tank or getting close to a quarter, you start making plans on where you're going to get gas and it, it, it has some level of urgency for you. Raise your hands. I am impressed. Uh, very responsible people. How many of you are with me, the rest of us, where basically your strategy involves mostly faith and fumes? And it's like you, you, your, your instrument panel says 14 miles to empty, and you, you look at it and you're like, we'll see about that. Uh, and uh, you know that the closest gas station is 22 miles away, but you've, you've prayed through before, and you'll pray through again. And uh, you coast in on uh, absolute uh, fumes and a wing and a prayer. Um, a lot of us operate that way. Um, what I think is more concerning is that if there were a tank in your soul that was designed to be filled with hope, a lot of believers I run into are running on fumes. This life that we're living in and this world that we're living in has seemed to drain the hope out of us. And when we face a trial or when we enter a relationship or we move into a new week or a new opportunity, we lack hope. We just don't feel hope. And one of the reasons is the world we live in. It's something we all have in common. We live in a broken world, don't we? We live in a world that... um, in spite of our best intentions to live with optimism and have a spring in our step and you know, lean forward into the good things that lay ahead of us that we hope lay ahead of us, this world just seems to be robbing us of reasons to have hope. Whether it's the wars that rage and the threats of war that continue, or whether it's the economy that may or may not be on the brink, or whether it's failures in government or other levels of society, or whether it's just the pure, unadulterated evil that seems to be pumped into our society uh, from all corners, where our society moves further away from God and, and with, with greater boldness and deviance against God and against God's, God's truths. We, we struggle with looking at the days ahead of us with hope. And for some people, it's not the society as much, as it is their own circumstances that are personal to them, Uh, either a broken relationship or a betrayal that they've experienced, a heartbreaking circumstance, or maybe a health trial, or a stubborn addiction, or a personal failure. These circumstances that are in front of us seem to have zapped us of hope. And what I hope happens in your life is that the panic and the worry and the fear and the anger and the frustration and the defeat that so many of us are living defined by get displaced by hope. I hope we can take the book of 1 Peter and pour it into the reservoir of your soul over the next several weeks. And as we work through the book of 1 Peter, you're going to find reasons to live with confident hope. The book of 1 Peter is a great reminder for you and I as believers living today that we are not the first Christians to live in a hostile environment, in a world that's filled with threats and reasons for fear, and frankly, that lives in opposition to Jesus Christ and to His children. This letter, 1 Peter, was a, was a letter written by the Apostle Peter two Christians living with and dealing with the same kinds of things we're living with and dealing with today. This letter was written about 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So the Christianity has begun to spread. It was written by his most prominent apostle, Peter, who was the key leader in the early church in the first century. It was written during a time when it was difficult, very difficult, to be a Christian. Christianity had been viewed by the Roman society, which controlled government and culture. Christianity had been viewed as just a little harmless sect, like a little cult group who means no harm. 
Uh, they were sort of seen in the early days after Jesus' resurrection as a, a sect within Judaism because most of the, all the first believers were Jewish. Uh, their Messiah was Jewish. But what happened over the next few decades between the time of Jesus' resurrection and the time of the writing of this letter was Christianity exploded. People by the thousands began to turn to Jesus Christ. People from all kinds of different nations began to follow Christ. And Christianity had morphed from a, a group of 100 people upon Jesus' resurrection to multiplied hundreds of thousands that spread all over the region under the Roman Empire. And the emperor Nero saw them as a threat. And so persecution began to be pushed upon the Christians. And to make matters worse, around the time this letter was written, Rome burned. Most people believed that Nero had been responsible for burning his own amazing capital city for his desire to undertake more construction projects. Definitely a, a psychotic individual. And yet, when the people began to look at Nero to place blame on him, he fabricated an argument that the Christians must have started the fires. And he convinced his fellow Romans that the Christians had burned Rome. And so the persecution went from bad to worse. Can you identify with this? Things are going bad in the world. People are messing up the world. And then someone looks at the Christians and says, I think it's your fault, actually. That's what happened in the lives of these people. And so the, the, the persecution that was already severe became overwhelming. Many Christians lost their lives as martyrs, as some still are today in other parts of the world. And uh, it was so severe, Nero was known for spearing Christians, taking their lives, killing them, dipping their bodies in oil, and lining the perimeter of his palace gardens with their lit bodies as torches. This is the backdrop on which Peter writes this letter to people who are legitimately suffering and fearing for their lives. In verse 1, he says he's writing to people in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What are these places? Well, I've got a little map for you. These are all regions of what we would call Asia Minor or what is modern-day Turkey. It's this large peninsula reaching out uh, between Asia and Europe into the Mediterranean Sea. And you see some of the labels of the cities or the, or the regions that Peter is writing to. How did Christianity get there? Well, two ways Christianity got there. In Acts 8, we are told that the Christians scattered from Jerusalem, and so Christians fled to that region uh, because of persecution. And then we learn later in Acts that Paul took his second missionary journey to many of the cities in this region. And so some of these believers receiving this letter are people who heard the gospel from Paul or from the churches Paul planted. And so Peter's writing to them, and they're suffering under the Roman persecution. Let's read the first five verses of the book. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The word hope, which appears in the third verse of the passage we just read, appears uh, four total times in this book, three times in the first chapter, because Peter is writing to give these people hope. Uh, it appears 55 times in the New Testament. But I think something that's important is that we define the word hope because from when they used this Greek word, elpis, which was translated hope, to the way we use the word hope today, 
the potency of the word has greatly diminished. We use the word hope to describe something we, we wish would happen or we think would be nice if it happened. Like, for example, it sure is a nice weekend, a nice weather. I hope every day this week's like that. That's not going to happen, all right? That's kind of how we use the word hope. I hope I get the promotion. Well, you might or you might not. Uh, I hope my team wins the game. Your team might win. Your team probably will lose if you're a Detroit sports fan. Um, but... Um, but, but the, our day is coming, so be patient. But that's how we use the word hope. I hope these problems will work themselves out. Or in more serious contexts, I hope that the doctor gives me good news from the results I were, was tested for. So we use this word hope to sort of describe just a wish or a preference, a desire. That is not what the word means on the pages of Scripture. We use it as a verb, I hope this, I hope that. It was used as a noun to describe something within us. And the something within us that it was used to describe is a confident expectation. A confidence, God word, about the future. It carries the connotation of anticipation, God's favor the future, and the blessings that await us in God. And so I'm going to give you a working definition that we will use for the next 10 or 12 weeks as we study 1 Peter. A working definition for hope, as Peter uses the term, is confident expectation of God's grace over your future. Do you have, listen, as you look at your calendar, as you look at your Roles in life as a parent, a spouse, a grandparent, a a neighbor, an employee, a citizen. Are you filled with confident expectation of the grace of God which is settling over the days of your life? Or is it more question marks and red flags? Well, the Bible teaches in 1 Peter that we can live with that hope. That's what Paul's desire was actually for the people that he ministered to as well. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you. Listen to this description. That's God's plan and desire for you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's God's desire for you. That you would live not just with Pollyanna optimism, but that you would live with a Holy Spirit-infused confidence and peace and joy about the days that are ahead. We live with hope for a lot of reasons. And each little section of 1 Peter is going to give us another reason for hope. But 1 Peter begins where your faith journey began. And that is with your salvation. So the first reason we are going to discover to live with hope, is that we have been given a salvation. I think it's very probable that you didn't understand all the nuances of the salvation you received when you received it. I know I didn't. I was nine years old. I asked Jesus to save my soul. Never forgotten it. It was, it was the real deal. But I didn't understand the beauty and the glory and the genius, and the wonder, and the supernatural nature of what I received that day at my bedside when I turned my heart to Christ in repentance and faith. We've had people of various ages in recent weeks uh, receive Christ as their Savior in our church, and I think a lot of times the common denominator is we're grateful to know and discover that God is willing to rescue us from the consequences of our sin, but it's, it's one of the beautiful things about being a Christian is You can spend the whole rest of your life rediscovering new facets of the salvation you were given. And I hope that's what you sense as you look at these five verses with me today. Verse 3, would you go back there? It's kind of the key verse in the five verses that we're studying today. Blessed be the God, or praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to His abundant mercy... That's where salvation begins. God's abundant mercy. Nothing He sees in you, it's, it's, it begins with His abundant mercy. 
has begotten us again. That means we're born again. He's, I said last week, He's brought us to life. He's raised us from a spiritual death. He's begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus. So because Jesus came out of the grave, came back to life supernaturally, He is able to do for you spiritually what He did for Himself physically. Bring you to life. Give you a spiritual pulse and bring you to life on the inside a soul that is living that will go on into eternity with God forever. That's salvation. But verses 2 and 4 and 5 tell us specifically what about this salvation gives us hope. We live with hope because of three aspects of our salvation. Verse 2, verse 4, and verse 5. According to verse 2, we live with hope because of God's work that saves us. When you look at what God did to save your soul, it will fill you with hope. And that's what verse 2 is about. Verse 2 shows us that the work of salvation begins with God and depends, listen, solely on God, not on us. Salvation is accomplished by God alone with no contribution from us. Look at the verse. Elect, that means saved or chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I think it's interesting that he mentions God's eternal foreknowledge in in the second verse of this letter because these people are in a panic. And when you think about God's eternality and you think about the fact that God has been working for your good since before you were created, it can help you relax and realize nothing takes this God of mine who is eternal and who has foreknowledge and who is sovereign. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing hampers him or hinders him or boxes him in. This is not shocking to him. This is not putting him in a panic. He has been working over and in my life for my salvation since before I was ever created. That's what foreknowledge reminds us of. Um, This verse shows us that all three members of our triune God are directly involved in our salvation. And I think it's beautiful. It says the Father, we are elect according to His foreknowledge. Now, let's define some terms and let's clarify some terms. Elect means to be chosen or called out. The word church is an ecclesia. It means the called out ones. The idea is there's this whole world rushing towards its destruction, and God is rescuing, God is calling out, God is um, choosing people and calling people. Uh, I I want to clarify this, that God has invited all men to be saved. All people uh, can be saved. Uh, Don't let this uh, word give you the incorrect conclusion that God is choosing some to be Christians and choosing some to be eternally lost. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for all people. Uh, Acts 17.30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires all people to be saved. And in 1 Peter 3.9, the book we're studying, it says He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God has invited the whole world, but When we hear these words about elect and foreknowledge, it causes us to wonder how the sovereignty of God fits with the responsibility of man. How the free will of man to reject or receive Christ fits into the foreknowledge and eternality of God. And and my answer to you how they fit together is, I don't know. (laughs) Because I'm not eternal. And I'm not God. Theologians have argued and debated and struggled to define how this works. But suffice it to say, the Bible teaches both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of men to turn to Him in repentance and faith. And I would say this, the takeaway from this idea of God's foreknowledge and His election in our lives, it should humble us to think about the fact that God has been working in your life since before He created you. He's no stranger. He's close. He's got plans. He's got purpose. 
He saw you before Jesus went to the cross, before last week's trial cropped up, before today's difficulty entered your life. God has been working and will be working in your life according to His sovereign grace. That's the Father. Let's keep moving through this verse because we've got the Father and the Spirit and the Son. It says the Spirit is involved through sanctification. I love the idea of sanctification. What does sanctification mean? Well, sanctification means to set something apart. That's what the word to sanctify means. Uh, if you want to have a Bible illustration, in the Old Testament, among all the people of Israel, God set apart the priests for special service to Himself. Uh, you might have some dishes in China at home, and you might polish some and set some aside for a special occasion. You've set it apart for a special purpose. That's the connotation of the word sanctification, to be set apart for a special purpose. And the Bible says that for people who are believers in Christ, who are the elect, they have been sanctified by the Spirit. It's kind of neat, the sanctification. You have been sanctified, you are being sanctified, and you will be sanctified. What do I mean by that? Well, if you got saved, When you got saved, God set you apart for Himself. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. But you haven't arrived yet, have you? So He is sanctifying you. He's working on you and me, and He's making us more like Jesus. We're becoming sanctified. We're becoming more like Christ. It carries the connotation of holiness. We're becoming more like Christ and less like our old, sinful, lost, rebellious selves. That's that's what's happening in our sanctification now. And then we will be one day set apart literally, physically, in heaven with God forever. So we were sanctified, that's our justification. We are being sanctified, that's our transformation. And we will be sanctified, that's our glorification. And this is all accomplished by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is inside of you, making you more like Christ. Early, when you came to Christ, the Holy Spirit was the one whispering in the ear of your soul, convicting you of your need, helping you to sense the weight of your guilt and sin, condemning you before a holy God, and convincing you that the gospel message was true and that Jesus Christ did die for you and that God can forgive you and that God does love you and that God will cleanse you of your sin if you come to Him. The Holy Spirit is working and the Holy Spirit is God's seal, Ephesians 1 says, God's down payment, His earnest in our lives that He will perform the work He started in us. This should give us hope. This salvation that we have, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Spirit is working in our sanctification. It says He is working in our sanctification unto obedience. Obedience is the natural result, assumed result of what it means to become a Christian. Really important clarification. We are not saved by our obedience. We are saved unto obedience. That's what the word is in the verse. We are saved unto obedience. So you should put out of your mind any notion that God doesn't care about our behavior and our choices. God does call us to obedience. God does care about our obedience. And the apostles assumed that our obedience would follow our faith in Christ. And so, we are saved and sanctified by the Spirit unto obedience. And then it says, by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. We've seen the Father and the Spirit, and now we see the Son. Jesus Christ shed His blood, God's Son, on the cross for us. This phraseology, the sprinkling of the blood, is a phraseology that Peter is borrowing from Jewish worship at the temple. At the Jewish temple for hundreds of years, the people would sacrifice animals, capture their blood, and sprinkle that blood on the atonement place, the mercy seat inside the temple. And that's how the people of Israel knew that once a year, their sins had been paid for, and God had provided for their redemption through the sacrifice of that animal, and that their sins had been forgiven by the sprinkling of the blood of that annual sacrifice. But, but Peter is saying to people here, you have been saved by the sprinkling of the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And He gave His life so that your sins could be washed away. 1 John 2, 2, uh, 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So when you realize, think about how this relates to hope. 
when you realize that the Father and the Spirit and the Son have been and are working in your life to save you and to deliver you to heaven, you realize that your salvation doesn't depend on you. So on your days, when you don't feel like a very good Christian, you can remind yourself from the Scriptures that your Christianity wasn't built by you, it wasn't earned by you, and it wasn't achieved by you. It was earned and achieved and secured and given by Almighty God Himself, and He never has a bad day. And your salvation rests in Him, so you can rest in Him. When we begin to doubt and get plagued with fear, if we're truly saved, if we've truly turned to Christ in repentant faith, and it's not complicated, if we've been saved, when we are plagued with doubt and fear, it's because we're, we're, we're not resting in the Lord. We're, we're putting the pressure on ourselves. And the Bible says that our hope comes through grace. This is 2 Thessalonians 2.16. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, has loved us and given us good hope through grace. The reason you have good hope is through grace. Grace is what has achieved that hope for you, not your works or effort. And here's the one last thing I'd like to take away from this idea that it's God's work that saves us. If God has, since eternity past, been working for your salvation and has sent His Spirit inside of you, and shed His Son's blood for you, He's not going to be careless with your life. He's not going to be careless with your life. He's not going to take His hands off the wheel and disregard. Because the work that God has undertaken to save us gives us hope. We live with hope because God's work that saves us and because of, verse 4, God's inheritance that awaits us. <clears throat> verse 2 shows us we were saved by someone. Verse 4 shows us we were saved for something. <clears throat> There's something awaiting us. <clears throat> and this verse tells us where. This inheritance, verse 4, is reserved in heaven for you. Do you have any reservations you've made? Some of you got on the... Uh, State of Michigan Department of uh, Natural Resources website six months and one minute before your desire to check in at a state park campground and you made your reservation. <clears throat> and you, you know that your reservation is secured. Others of you are in a panic. You're the same people coasting into the gas station on fumes. <clears throat> you don't know where you're going to go on vacation. You don't know if you're going to have a vacation. <clears throat> But, but you know what it's like to have a reservation waiting for you. Sometimes, <clears throat> someone with a higher level of loyalty status at a particular hotel can come into a hotel and demand a room and actually bump someone with an existing reservation. But you have a reservation in heaven secured for you that cannot be bumped, will not be canceled, and is already underway. That's what this verse says. It's reserved in heaven for you. Now think of this. And where does this, where does this give us hope? How does this give us hope? I would become a Christian if it were only for the benefits in this life. There are great benefits in this life to being a Christian. You have a, a guide in not only God's Word, but in God's Spirit. There is a wisdom and a favor that rests over your life that leads you. There is God's providence always working on your behalf. There are the amazing relationships that come with the the spiritual family that you get. There is the peace and the joy and the confidence and the the companionship of God. through. There's answered prayer. The benefits to Christianity in this life are worth becoming a Christian. But no Christian should ever forget that the greatest benefits of your salvation will not be obtained in your life until you've left this world. And you have something awaiting for you that is extraordinary. Christians are to always be looking toward heaven. And what Peter is trying to do in this book is tell these suffering, struggling people that, that, that they can hang in there because there's something, there is a reward awaiting 
their faithful, patient, enduring obedience to Christ. There is a reward awaiting them that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that will not fade away. In heaven, there is unmitigated joy, peace that cannot be robbed by circumstances, perfection. There will be no evil allowed in heaven. There will be no bullies in heaven. There will be no uh, uh, fear in heaven. There will be no disease in heaven. It won't be spoiled by evil. Jesus will be our companion. The rewards will be beyond what we could imagine. Not, Not that we earned because we were so great, but because Jesus Christ enabled us by His grace to walk in obedience to Him and and he's, these crowns that we receive will be laid at his feet as an act of praise. And, and, and 1 Corinthians 2.9 says it this way, Eye has not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Christianity is so much more than just a therapeutic salve for today. No, no. Christianity is an inheritance that awaits you. And there's an interesting correlation here that we would do well to think about. The Christians on this earth who are living in the greatest anticipation of heaven happen to be the Christians who are enjoying the fewest benefits here on earth. Think about your brothers and sisters in the Middle East. Think about your Christian siblings in China who when they worship today will worship in fear for their lives. Think about Christians like you and me who live on the continent of Africa in abject poverty. These people long for heaven with an ache and with a desire and with an anticipation that sometimes we don't identify with. The less you enjoy here, the more you tend to anticipate heaven and that anticipation actually breeds hope. Now let's talk about us for a minute. We're blessed. We should be thankful for those blessings. We don't need to feel guilty for those blessings. We should steward those blessings. But we should also be aware that those blessings that we enjoy, religious freedom, relative health, wealth that this world has not known of in history, we are prone to forget that this isn't all there is. We are prone to find so much satisfaction in this and so much joy in this and so much pleasure in this that we forget that this wasn't supposed to satisfy us and we have been made for more. And what happens is when you spend your whole week and your whole life and all of your energies and thoughts and efforts and priorities on making this life so good, You're tying your hope to this. Now listen, don't get me wrong. We need to be salt and light in this world. We should this world should be a better place because we lived and 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 influenced the people around us. Absolutely, no question. The world should be a better place because of Christians in workplaces and in societies and in government and so forth. That's 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 understood. But don't ever forget our citizenship is in heaven. And be careful about tying your hope to how this is going. Because when this goes off the rails, like it does and is, your hope will go off the rails with it. But when you realize that your hope is tied to heaven, you pull away the mooring ropes from here and you attach them there. When you live for and study and think about and invest in eternity and heaven, You are assured by Peter and the apostles that the inheritance awaiting you is incorruptible. It won't deteriorate from where. It's undefiled. It won't be damaged by evil. It doesn't fade away. It won't diminish over time. You realize that there is a durability to your hope because there is a durability to your inheritance. There is a durability to where you're headed and what God has given you in salvation. These things down here, they should disappoint us. They should fail us. They will wear out and wear away. And what shined and glistened and drew us to it two or three or five years ago is cast aside because we're not as satisfied with it anymore. That's the nature of this old, broken, temporal, earthly world. Christians 
fix their affection, Colossians 3, 2, on things above, not on things on the earth. I hope that that which you're most anticipating is not a promotion or a raise or a purchase that is on the horizon, but it is a heaven with God awaiting you. If you do that, if you focus on that, your hope will be durable. And you don't have to get discouraged that your best days are behind you. A lot of people in this world are downright depressed. Middle age will do it to you. Uh, Failing health in your golden years will do it to you. An economic downturn or a, a, a career, a career uh, upheaval will do it to you where you think to yourself, I'm never going to get back there. I have my, I have my good days. I'm never going to get back there. My, my best days are behind me. And there are people that are literally depressed because their best days, they're convinced, are behind them. But for the Christian who's living for heaven, the greatest days for you always lie ahead. And so we live with hope because of God's work that saves us, because of God's inheritance that awaits us, and because of, verse number five, God's power that keeps us. We, verse five, are kept by the power of God unto, through, through faith unto salvation. This will give you hope if you'll let it. The God who saved you is also powerful enough to keep you. We know that we were saved by grace through faith, not of works. But sometimes the devil gets up on our shoulder and tries to accuse us. Revelation says he's the accuser of the brethren. Uh, he, He basically beats us up and says, if you were a Christian, you wouldn't live like that. God doesn't, God's frustrated at you. God's annoyed with you. God's disappointed in you. Now, it might be true that you're disappointed in yourself. We do that to ourselves. But, but listen, you didn't save yourself and you can't keep yourself saved because your salvation wasn't based on your performance and retaining your salvation is also not based on your performance. It says we are kept by the power of God. It doesn't say here we are kept by our good behavior. Keep your nose clean or God's going to kick you out of the family. No, no. We are kept by the power of God. Have you ever wondered if you could sin so much that you lose your salvation? The last straw. I'm a parent. And I have four kids. And, and, and I know that in the lives of those four kids, they, there is, you know, your kids can hurt you, can't they? They could run away. They could disown me. They could not leave a forwarding address. They could tell me they don't want to have anything to do with me. But let me ask you a question. Does that change whether they're my child? No. Uh, There's nothing you can do to change the fact that you've become God's child if you've been born again. Think of the imagery of the New Testament. We've been born into His family. He also says we've been adopted into His family. We got two kids by birth, and we got two kids by adoption. We have four in our family. God doubled it up for us. He brought us into his family through birth and through adoption. And he will not disinherit or disown us. In fact, the families in this room who have adopted know that the judge told them on their finalization day that they may not disown this child. My older two, I can disown them if I choose to. But the, the Children's Court of Los Angeles County dictated that it, it is illegal for me to disown the adopted ones. In other words, God's not going to get tired of you and kick you out of the family if you've been saved. If you haven't been saved, you need to turn to Christ in repentance and faith. Here's what Jesus says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Jesus said this in John 10. This is so beautiful what Jesus said. He said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. My Father and I are one. Isn't that an amazing security? There's a gospel song, I think, that says, 
I'm not holding on to him. He's holding on to me. That's a reference to this verse. We are kept by the power of God. Imagine your little soul in Jesus' hand. And imagine that no one is able, he said that, no one is able to pluck them out of his hand. And if that weren't enough, I think Jesus' hand would have been enough. No man is able to pluck us out of the Father's hand. And then Ephesians 1 says that the Holy Spirit is our seal. Imagine these hands with a little something in there that it's not going to be snatched out, being wrapped up in, in shrink wrap and sealed up. All the joints caulked. We're not getting out. Someone says, well, I, I knew a Christian one time that they said they were a Christian, they went to church with me, and they had all the signs of a Christian, and then they, they reached a point where they said they stopped believing, and they walked away from God and the church, and they say they don't consider themselves a Christian anymore. Well, what about them, Pastor Tim? Again, I'm going to lean on my favorite answer. I don't know. But I do know this. The Scripture says no one can pluck us out of God's hand. And I don't know if that person maybe is just very deceived and they will be surprised like we will be to see them in heaven or whether that person never truly had their heart converted and maybe they were just going along with the motions. I don't know. It's not my job to judge. My job is to lean into and rest in humble gratitude over Christ having saved me and kept me. What... um, what could separate us from God? Romans 8.35 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay. In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no need to live plagued with fear and doubt. God's not playing games with your salvation. If you have from a sincere heart turned to Him in repentance and faith, um, He's saved and secures your soul. Um, That's I keep mentioning if you've been saved, because it's very likely and possible that there would be a handful of people here who would say, you know what, I don't think I ever have been truly saved. I've gone to church, I've, I've um, you know, maybe been through some religious, jumped through some religious hoops, but I don't know that I've ever truly been born again. Well, the Bible says that that involves turning to God with repentance and faith. Repentance meaning that we realize we're condemned and guilty sinners and would rightfully be punished for all of eternity by a holy God. And we believe, that's where the faith comes in, we believe what He said to us, that He can rescue us and save us and forgive our sin if we will turn to Him and humbly throw ourselves on His mercy. That's salvation. Sometimes you'll ask someone, um, hey, uh, do you know if you're going to heaven? And they give you whatever answer they give you. And then you ask them, well, well why, would you, why would you say that you're confident about that? And they say something like this, well, because I go to church. Or because I, uh, I'm a good person. Because I'm a good neighbor. Because I, cop- I stopped kicking the dog. Or because I, um, I, I live by the golden rule. If someone asks you about your salvation and the first word of your answer is I, you probably haven't trusted Christ for your salvation. You're depending on yourself. And one of the things that repentance is, is realizing, oh no, not only am I not good enough to save myself, I never could be. So I'm lost without His rescue. And so I turn to Him. And uh, placing our faith in Him instead of in ourselves. And that's what it means to come to Christ. We're going to pray in a few minutes, and when we do... If you've, if you've not received Christ, but you right now are under the weight of an awareness that that's what you need to do, you could pray in your seat and ask Jesus Christ to save your soul. Last week, we sang a song that was based on the third verse of this passage, Living Hope. And when we think about the hope of our salvation, which we've studied in these five verses, I want you to think about the lyrics from the second verse of the song we sang last Sunday. 
Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. That should be our heart attitude toward the Lord. So when we pray, you might thank the Lord for saving you. You might thank the Lord for heaven and ask the Lord to help you to shift your hope from this world to that world. Or maybe you need to ask Jesus Christ to save your soul right now. This could be your spiritual birthday where you're brought from death to life, where you're raised to life and Jesus Christ comes into your life, forgives your sin and adopts you as his son or as his daughter. Let's pray together. Lord, we uh, thank you for your grace that has brought us to yourself and that has forgiven our sin and secured us as your sons and daughters. Thank you, thank you, thank you.